नमस्कार आप सभी का बहुत बहुत स्वागत है यू आर वॉचिंग पी एम ई विद्या चैनल चैनल नंबर नाइन एंड आई एम रेणु भट्ट विद यू ऑल एंड इन दिस सेशन वी आर गोइंग टू लर्न मोर अबाउट फोर्स लॉस ऑफ मोशन पार्ट थर्ड पार्ट फर्स्ट एंड सेकेंड यू हैव ऑलरेडी लर्न इफ यू वॉन्ट टू एक्सप्लोर दैट सेशन सो यू वॉन्ट टू वी वॉच दैट सेशन वन मोर टाइम यू कैन गो एंड एक्सप्लोर आर यूट्यूब चैनल दैट इज एन सी आर टी ऑफिशियल एंड लेट मी टेल यू सम इन्फॉर्मेशन डियर लर्नर्स इफ यू वॉन्ट टू जॉइन एस इफ यू वॉन्ट टू कनेक्ट टू एस और इफ यू वॉन्ट टू आस्क एनी क्वेरी एंड क्वेश्चन फील फ्री टू कनेक्ट टू एस ऑन आर टेल फ्री नंबर दैट इज डबल एट डबल जीरो डबल फोर जीरो डबल फाइव नाइन एंड यू कैन ड्रॉप अ मेल ऑल्सो एट आर ईमेल एड्रेस दैट इज टी टी एच डॉट क्लास नाइन एट दी आई टी डॉट एन आई सी डॉट आई एन एंड लेट्स मीट आर एक्सपर्ट ऑफ दिस सेशन यू आर मिस्टर राहुल एस चटर्जी असिस्टेंट लेक्चर आर फिजिक्स शिलोंग जेल रोड बॉयज सीनियर सेकेंडरी स्कूल शिलोंग वेरी वॉम वेलकम सर थैंक यू वेरी मच so as we have already told our learners that we have already learned part 1 and part 2 so sir i would request you to uh, tell something about part 1 and part 2 then we'll begin our session sir a brief recap sir sure thank you very much so today is the third part of the lesson in uh, in our class 9 textbooks force and laws of motion and in the last two sessions first in in the first session we understood what is force and uh, uh, by understanding what are the different things that force can do and ultimately we developed the uh, first law of newton and we saw that the first law of newton is basically a qualitative law it only tells us what we have to do to bring about a change in motion of a body it does not tell us how much we have to do so it does not tell us anything in quantity so we say it is a qualitative law and in physics unless we can measure something it is not good enough so we need a quantitative law so in the second lesson what we did was we ultimately developed the second law that is a quantitative law but to do that we first looked at inertia the idea of inertia hmm. and we looked at a few experiments and the first experiment we did was flicking the card placed on top of a tumbler and uh, we placed a light coin on the card and uh, we kind of you know had an experience of the amount of force required to flick the card and if we placed a heavier coin then we noticed that we had to flick the card with a with a greater force so uh, we repeated other experiments and let's look at those that we we know from experience that if we are to move a heavy body a large force is required suppose the body is at rest and we want to move it like sometimes we want to move furniture at home furniture is usually heavy so large force is required to move it or there is a heavy body already in motion however uh, slow that motion may be but if the body is heavy a large force is required to stop it from motion then we've seen that in comparison a light body requires a much smaller force to be stopped when the velocities are the same of the heavy body and the light body then we've seen that if we have two bodies of the same mass and we apply the same force to both of them then the acceleration produced in the two of them is different the body receiving the greater force will have a higher acceleration whereas the body receiving the smaller force will have a smaller acceleration and so from all these experiments what did we conclude first we said heavier objects of a larger inertia it's more difficult to move them or more difficult to stop them whatever they are doing they continue to do that or they at least have a tendency to continue to do that then quantitatively we understand that the inertia of an object is measured by its mass and then we said that therefore we may relate inertia and mass as follows that inertia is the natural tendency of an object to resist change in its state of motion or of rest the mass of an object is a measure of its inertia meaning to say greater the mass 
greater is the inertia. That means greater is the tendency to resist any change. And mathematically, these ideas can be summarized as that the acceleration produced is directly proportional to the force applied as long as we keep the mass constant. And conversely, the acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass of the body, keeping the force constant. Now, these two ideas need to seep into our minds, our heads, because that will help us in understanding conceptually this whole chapter. Then we looked at the idea of momentum, and we saw that a heavy body, however slow it may be moving, requires a large force to be stopped. And a light body like a bullet also requires a large force to stop because its velocity is very high. So both ways, it's very difficult to stop it. One, because the mass is very high, and in the other, because the speed is very high. And therefore, when we are talking about bringing about a change in its motion, the product of mass and velocity becomes important. Newton coined this new term, momentum, which is a product of mass and velocity. And so the total force required to bring about any change in the motion of a body will be the product of the mass and the velocity of the body. And the product of mass and velocity is called momentum. So the symbol for momentum is P, and so we write P is mass into velocity. And from there, we had a look at Newton's second law of motion. And as I already mentioned to you, this is a quantitative law. So from this, we can make measurements and calculations. So it says that the rate of change of momentum of an object is proportional to the applied unbalanced force in the direction of force. That means the direction of force and the direction of change of momentum must be the same. Even if you are applying the force in a different direction, then the component of the force in the direction of motion must be taken. And so if we put, uh, put that mathematically, we've developed it in the last uh, second, that means in the second class, we've developed it in detail. So I'm just taking the final expression. So we've, we saw that the force is mass it times the change in velocity over time. Now, this of course is true, assuming that the mass remains constant. That is why we could take the mass common out. Otherwise it was change in momentum. It was mv minus mu. So we are assuming that the mass remains constant throughout the process. And so we could take the mass common out. But if the mass is not constant, then we cannot take it common out and so the structure of the formula will remain like this, m2v minus m1u by t. Now, are there situations where mass don't remain constant, mass does not remain constant? Of course, there are so many situations where mass does not remain constant. Say, for example, uh, a rocket burning its fuel as it goes up. A rocket which is going up is a really heavy mass. It's more than a thousand kgs. And so the amount of fuel it burns up per second is very, very high. And so it gets lighter very fast. So the mass changes as it goes up. So the mass is not constant. Or an escalator into which people are getting on or from which people are getting off. So if people are climbing onto an escalator, the mass is changing. More and more mass is being added to it. Or at the end of the steps, uh, right at the top, people are getting off from the escalator. So, they, so the load on the escalator is reducing. Or let's say a conveyor belt at the airport on which luggage is being loaded or from which luggage is being offloaded. In all these cases, there is a change in mass. So it's not always that mass remains constant. So mass may remain constant in certain situations. Say, for example, a moving cricket ball that you that you stop, or a moving football that you stop. These are situations where the mass does not change. 
and there are situations where the mass changes. And these are some examples of that. So both are possible. So depending on what the situation is, you will accordingly use the formula. So let us continue with the situation when mass is constant. And let us have a look at that formula in slightly more detail. Now here, we have this structure. If mass is constant, we can take the mass common out m. Now suppose we do not apply any force. Suppose f is 0. So left hand side is 0, which means right hand side has to be 0. Now mass of the body cannot be 0. Time elapsed is also not 0, which means v minus u is 0, which means final velocity and initial velocity are equal which means there is no change in velocity. And that is what Newton's first law is all about. It says, if we do not apply a force, then there cannot be any change in the velocity. So this formula directly reflects that idea in Newton's first law, right? And if there is a force applied, mass does not change, time change is all right, and therefore there must be a change in the velocity and that is again a reflection of what we have in Newton's first law. Okay. Let's move the uh, time to the other side and write this formula in this manner. That force into time is change in momentum or m into v minus u. Now let's take an example and understand this uh, particular example slightly better. Let's take this example, where, as you can see, this picture is directly from your textbook, uh, figure 9.8 in your textbook directly. So as you can see uh, in this picture, here is a boy catching a cricket ball. And all of you who play cricket would have been told by your coach or your friends, or you would have learned it through experience, that the safe way to catch a cricket ball is to get hold of the cricket ball and then pull your hands down gradually and finally bring it to a rest. So what is happening is the cricket ball is having a certain mass that is fixed. Mass is not changing. It is moving with a certain velocity. So it has a certain momentum. And that momentum ultimately will become zero when you finally stop the ball. So there is a change in momentum that is happening. From a certain momentum, the momentum is going to become zero. Now the question is, in how much time are you going to make it zero? If the time is large, then the force required is small because the product must be equal to the change in momentum. Notice very carefully. If I take the, ma the mass inside, then it is mv minus mu, which means change in momentum, right? So this amount of change in momentum, because final momentum is zero, Final velocity is zero because I'm stopping the ball. So final momentum is zero. And the, the ball had a certain initial momentum. So this change in momentum is a fixed quantity. This fixed quantity can be achieved by the product of F and T. So if T is large, F is going to be small. Or the other way around, if T is small, F is going to be large. And from experience, those of you who play cricket with a real cricket ball, you would know if you just place your hand in the path of a cricket ball, in the path of a very fast moving cricket ball, you would really get hurt very badly because the time that you have taken to stop it is very small. And so the force that you have applied is very large. And therefore, you get hurt very badly with the cricket ball. Whereas, if you get hold of the ball and pull your hand gradually and bring it to a stop, then the time increases, so force required is less, and so you don't get hurt. The same thing happens when uh, high jumpers, after the jump, fall. They are not allowed to fall on hard ground. They would hurt themselves. We put mattresses, thick mattresses, so that the velocity gradually comes to zero. It over a certain period of time, it becomes zero. So time increases, and so the force is small. And th therefore, they are uh, a lot safer. 
Uh, so with that at the, as the background, uh, let's move on to Newton's third law. Now, Newton's third law says that to every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Again, this picture is uh, from your textbook directly, and this is a very, very illustrative example. You have a rigid support like a wall or something on which you, um, you know, attach a spring balance, to which you attach another spring balance, and which you pull. And you would find that both the spring balances show exactly the same reading. Exactly the same reading. The action is on this spring balance A. And the reaction is by the spring balance B. And so B is pulling A with exactly the same force with which you are pulling A. And so ultimately what happens is both of them show exactly the same reading, though the two are acting in exactly opposite directions. We can have other examples of uh, this situation. Here, let's say we have a wall, a huge heavy wall. In comparison to the man, the wall is many, many times heavier. And so this man pushes the wall. And so as a result, what happens? He gets pushed back. Remember, the important thing to understand in Newton's third law is that while action and reaction are equal and opposite, the important thing to understand is action is on the wall, reaction is on the man. Action and reaction don't happen on the same object. They are separate objects. Action is on the wall, reaction is by the wall, but on the man, in this example, on the man, right? So unless we keep in mind this fact, that action and reaction are on separate objects, we will not be able to explain many situations. One famous um, classical problem is the horse and car cart problem. So we often ask uh, students, so the horse is pulling the cart, then the cart should also pull the horse back, and equal and opposite, and they should cancel each other out. Then how come the horse and cart move forward? Well, the answer to that question is, the moment you tie the horse to the cart, they become one single system. So you cannot have action and reaction both on the same system. Action and reaction are always on two different bodies. So in the horse and cart problem, the action is by the horse on the ground, and the reaction is by the ground on the horse. So if the horse moves, the cart will move because the cart is simply tied to the horse. There is no other option. The other example you have in the book is of uh, the gun. When it shoots a bullet, there's an action and reaction. The action is of the bullet moving forward, and as a result, there is a reaction force, the recoil, we say, the recoil of the gun moving forward, moving backward towards the shooter. Now, remember one thing very carefully over here. Though the forces of action and reaction are equal, the acceleration they produce may not be equal because the mass of the object on which they act may not be equal. Like we saw the wall and the man. The wall is so many times heavier. So a light man, 50 kg, 60 kg, 70 kg, nothing in comparison to the wall, is pushing a wall. And therefore gets pushed back, but nothing happens to the wall. Simply because the wall is much, much heavier and the acceleration produced on the wall is much smaller, right? So this fact is to be remembered at all times, that though action and reaction forces are equal, the acceleration produced on the bodies may not be equal. They will be equal if the two masses are equal. Okay, and uh, to sum up everything we've learned, and to test really what we've understood, let us solve one problem 
from the questions that is given at the end of the chapter. And I've picked up question number six. And uh, question number six says that a stone of mass one kilogram is thrown with a velocity of 20 meters per second across the surface of a frozen lake. And it comes to rest after traveling a distance of 50 meters. What is the friction force of friction between the stone and the ice? OK, so if we read this, clearly what we can understand is that the initial velocity of the stone is 20 meters per second. The final velocity, of course, is going to be zero because it comes to rest. And the distance it travels in the meanwhile is 50 meters. And the mass of the stone is one kilogram. The question, of course, is what is the force of friction? Now, a frozen lake will obviously be a horizontal surface. So when a body is moving on a horizontal surface, the question of acceleration due to gravity does not come up. Acceleration due to gravity has no role to play in horizontal motion, right? So that is something we need to keep in mind. So let's copy all this data in the next slide. And so we have all this data. Now, we have to find uh, the force. Sir, to find the force, we know the only formula we know for force sir, is here, force is mass. Sir, here I, here I want to tell you that we have only three minutes more to wind up this session, sir. I will be through in less than three minutes. Sure, sir. Thank you. Um, so we have, uh, we have to find the force of friction. And uh, the only formula we know for force of friction is force is mass into acceleration. Mass we already know which means we need to find the acceleration. And I told you already, acceleration is not acceleration due to gravity because this is horizontal motion. And in horizontal motion, G plays no role. Okay, so we need to find the acceleration. So we use this relation, V squared equal to U squared plus two AS, and we substitute the values. So final velocity is zero, initial velocity is 20, 20 squared is 400 plus two into A into distance is 50 meters. So we substitute these values and so if I bring the 50 into 200 A to the other side, it becomes minus 100 A is 400. And so therefore, A is minus 4 meter per second. Oh, this is per second squared. Please pardon me. This should be 4 meter per second squared, not 4 meter per second. That's an error in my typing. OK, this is acceleration. It must be 4 meter per second squared. All right. And therefore, um, now we can uh, find the force. So force is mass into acceleration. And uh, so we know the mass. So substitute the value of the mass, one kilogram. And so we find the force required to stop the stone is minus four Newton, minus four Newton. Now, what is the, what is the meaning of the negative sign? It means that the force that is being applied on the stone is opposite to the direction of the motion of the body. And that's quite obvious, otherwise you cannot stop it, right? So that is the meaning of the negative sign. It signifies that the force of friction acts in direction opposite to that of the motion of the body. So let's end this class here and see you again on another session. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for joining us and for your informative session. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. So, dear learners and viewers, I just hope uh, uh, you have come to know so many things that you were not aware of. And here, let me wrap up this session here only. Uh, me, Renu Bhatt is signing off, but you stay tuned to stay with us on PM Avidya channel for more informative and live phone-in programs. Next is webinar. Namaskar.